I'm recording, but you're not recording. Yeah, I am. It doesn't say you're recording. It says I'm recording. I'm recording. We, we did this last time. We can't keep on. I know, but on my little doing this side, old man it doesn't, shit. But, yeah, but really? the participants, it doesn't say you're recording. Are you sure you're recording? Um, Record on this computer. Yeah, now you're recording. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think I'm recording. All, right, all right. So apologize. Well, I, <laughs> I got to apologize? Yeah, you said I am recording. And I was like, no, you're not. And you're like, yes, I am. But you weren't. Well, I got to apologize like a formality. I'm, you like, don't have to yeah. apologize, but you can recognize <laughs> that you act like I, I was stupid. I'll recognize. I'm not going to apologize. Stupid. I'll recognize. I recognize. Can I tell you something. Yeah, I'm going to I want to get I want to give you a couple bucks. I need you to get a bigger TV. It looks silly over there. <laughs> Look at it. You got a new furniture piece, though. Look at that. You got some new furniture coming in. Yeah, yeah. I got some good shit, man. Uh, it's kind of revealed it being a mess. Uh, it's a bigger TV. It's far away. It's actually not that small. And have um, you gotten uh, mouse traps or? Oh, that's uh, that's a uh, personal information here. We can't let well, people tell know. the story about the glass. It's an interesting story. <laughs> oh yeah. So I I uh, I left for the week and I came back and there was a glass on the coffee table that I left there whole, <laughs> and I come back and it's shattered on the table. I guess it maybe somehow got knocked over or my first thought was it had imploded. But you said that was uh, not. Likely. Like, uh, like it's a spinal <laughs> tap drummer. <laughs> but so I was like, I don't know what happened. Maybe, you know, you came in here and fucked like Sarah in here to, you know, spice things up, you know, <laughs> uh, maybe George or maybe George has got the key. I don't have a key. Yeah, I should have a George, key, though. Yeah, I don't know what it was. Uh, for a second, I thought it was like, you know, that like that California guy who like uh, rape people, you know, the, the person Pat Oswald's wife was searching for. Oh, yeah. Uh, he would like come into places first and like fuck around and then come back later. So I was worried about that for a second, but that was someone wanting to rape me. It's probably less likely than the uh, glass imploding. Um, I think and, they caught uh, him though, which well, they did, yeah, they caught it, him, which yeah. kind of had nothing to do with her, but it was like a, no, she didn't, a she convenient didn't. <laughs> ending to the movie. Yeah, she didn't really have. I honestly, I read the book. It's a great book, but she had a bunch of different theories, and I guess, but I guess she brought attention to it. No, someone found out they did a twenty three and me, yeah, and said they were cousins to a rapist or something, and then they tracked him down through that, or I don't know how it worked exactly, but uh, so yeah, so I don't know. But then uh, you suggested maybe I have a mouse, and the mouse was uh, you know, drinking, uh, drinking, <laughs> or uh. You know, showing who's boss or something. You know, I don't know. But so I, I haven't heard of Mouse or anything, but we'll see, you know. Um, by the way, I shouldn't say it had nothing to do with her, but they they found her, they found it via the 23 and me. But I think she, yeah. like you said, brought a lot of attention. Brought that attention doc was killer, by the way. Yeah, the book's great too. She's a great writer. Um, that was one of the most horrifying docs. Like it put me in a place that I was uncomfortable. Like I had to go turn the lights on and like watch Naked Gun afterwards. It was scary. Really? I kind of jacked off a bunch of times to it. I guess we had a different reaction. <laughs> I'm just joking. Jesus, what? You give me a shock look? I thought you were being serious. You think I'm being serious? <laughs> I don't know. You jerk off to everything. What the fuck? And the fact that you would think I'm be this is like fucking uh, uh, the hunt. You, you were friends and you suddenly think I'm a, a creep immediately. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you say you jerk off to things. I mean, there are sexual things about it. Maybe that's your thing. And by the way, I wouldn't like kink rape. shame. <laughs> that's more than a kink. I mean, like, <laughs> um, Jesus. But yeah, uh, anyway, uh, sorry. Taste, tasteless joke. I apologize. Um, yeah, I would, I, would, but, <laughs> I would think so. Clean it up. But let's get into these movies. Let's get into these flicks because one guy, uh, we got a couple comments being like, what is this shit? You talked for 30 minutes about nothing. <laughs> you can't please everybody. Some people are like, I love when they just bullshit. I don't even like Bad movies. Album. They don't know what they're talking about. So we might as well hear them riff. And then you riff for a half an hour and people are like you bag of shit. Roger we, Ebert never talked about his feet. Come on. But we, but we should uh, we should do one episode where we just riff the whole time and never get to the movie. That'd but put fun. movies in the title. Yeah. Yeah. Put movies in the title. And just gonna... never get to them. <laughs> That's funny. Um. So, yeah, this is our first foreign film one. We'll see what the views are like. I'm a little worried that uh, no one's going to watch this one, you know, but maybe our, our audience is cultured. You know, I, I think our audience. So I think our audience is cultured. I think we've weeded out all the non cultured folks. Yeah. And. If you're a true fan of movies, you got to go foreign the last 10 years. America is good for two to three good movies a year. Yes, exactly. I mean, there's usually they usually have one movie a year that's great. 
and a couple pretty good ones. And then if you want to actually continue to watch more great movies every year, you have to watch a fucking Japanese movie or a Swedish movie. We just we're, we're just too, we're like 90 percent Marvel. The odds of us having great movies, a lot of great movies, is just very low now because it's all, you know, Spider-Man's mother what happened to her when she was you know had a c-section you know what i mean so we're just kind of fu- we're just kind of fucked on that realm but these movies were uh i mean i mean very provocative movies i, I hadn't seen them this is your su- uh, suggestion yeah but this is a tricky thing that you do though here's what? the trick i just casually as a friend am like what are you doing why haven't you seen another round i'm telling yeah. you it's like one of the best movies ever it's yeah. amazing and then you go Hey, why don't we do another round and the hunt? And I go, yeah, that sounds great. And then that's my <laughs> so now you get to choose next week. But really, you chose this week. And you I chose, chose oh, these two movies. But I chose them to to, to indulge you because I thought you'd want to do them. I was I was choosing on your behalf with your consideration. right. But that next is week some, I choose without your consideration. Yeah, but that's yeah. This is some kind of abusive <laughs> relationship where you're tricking me into thinking that I chose this. Well, first so of all, for the, amount of, for the amount of comments saying uh, leave Ron on alone, I think we know which 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 direction the abuse goes in this relationship. Well, that's what's so ironic about it. That's the <laughs> that's the interesting thing. This is where you're a gaslighting asshole. <laughs> and I, I noticed it, too. I fell for it. I was sitting there going. So I guess this week he chooses. But you chose the movies. <laughs> I mean, I yeah, but I was choosing for you. You knew the you. you I knew you wanted to do this, but by, I never realized how much you bullied me until I, I put my special out. By the way, the people responding have been great, and it's it's been really it's been doing well. Go watch it; it's on YouTube. But uh, my old special. But so many comments were like, "You're not that fat." Like, like so many comments were based. You like make the fat <laughs> jokes. You make the fat jokes. And I go, what are you talking about? You're handsome. You're a good looking guy. That's and I say point, you're actually. not fat. I say That's you're a- not fat. <laughs> That's a good point, because I was thinking that people are like, why does Joe say he's fat all the time? I'm like, you're always saying I'm not fat. I know this is so this is what drives me crazy <laughs> about Internet comments. And I've talked about this recently on a mindful metal jacket, which is coming back soon. Hell yeah. It's I don't get mad when people are like, you suck. I get mad when they're like, you said this. And I'm like, no, I did no. not. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah, no, you are. You're always uh, lying to me and saying I'm thin and I really appreciate it. I don't um, say thin. I say you're 90s fat. I'm like, you're not even fat. like really fat. You're just well, like it, a bit I, fat. I, I think George Costanza is a really accurate uh, comparison because, you know, I'm watching a bunch of Seinfeld now and he has a good body, just a big head. He's got a big head and like a big neck and um, but he's skinny. It's just like me. I have a good, I'm like good. Well, not skinny, but I'm a- <laughs> <laughs> that might be a bit of a reach, but he's like me in the sense that all our fat goes to our face. So when you mm-hmm. see us naked, like when he gets the pictures in the underwear, uh, he looks pretty good because you've already seen where the fat's gone. It's gone to the head. It doesn't yeah. go to the body, which sucks because I look better once you see me naked than I do in the initial impression, which is tough because the initial impression is what you need to have the person see you naked. You know but what I mean? Part of it, I think, is the I should walk. start naked. You, the, you're a very slubby, poundy walk. I think that doesn't help. Well, I mean, like, I hear you, you walk. I'm, it, just, I'm above you. I'm not walking above most people. That's your that's that's a specific. Uh, but your feet yeah. move in that way, whether they're below you or not. It's a bit of yeah. a pound shuffle, it's like a pound a lumbery. It's a pound. It, it, it's, and then you're losing stuff all the time. We're walking. Yeah. You got to stop and feel all your pockets. That's not yeah. hot. Yeah, it's I, I sashay. I waddle. Right. There's a lot of waddling. I once I once got kicked out of a bar for being too drunk and I had just walked into the bar. I hadn't <laughs> had one drink. <laughs> they were like, You're too drunk. I'm like, No, I'm just a penguin. I'm just a waddler. But uh that happened anyway. one time. Oh, sorry, we gotta get into it. No, go ahead. Well, there was in in Boston or then Bridgewater, Massachusetts, there was a bar called Bogart's movies. We're talking movies. Yep, Bogart movies, calm down. <laughs> And they had a special. It was like eight dollars for a pitcher or whatever. Uh-huh. And so I was like, oh, that's a great beer deal. Obviously, I was a drunk. And so I just bought a pitcher and just started drinking out of it. I was like, I'll just drink this. Uh-huh. And they threw me out like Jazzy Jeff, like <laughs> two hands, like physically. I'm not even joking. They physically they threw you out? pushed like and if, threw me out. They're like, like who framed Roger asshole. Rabbit? Like, get out. like when he gets thrown into the alley. <laughs> yes. I appreciate another movie. We're, we're talking movies. <laughs> we're talking movies. <laughs> and I went outside and I had had like 
three sips of beer. I was dead sober. I mean, I was underage, but they didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> and then I just got outside and I was like, what the fuck? Jesus. I thought I was like cleverly saving some money like a Jew, a fat Jew I, like you. I, I guess they thought you drinking out of the pitcher was like a sideways moment, like drinking out of the spittoon. You know, I guess they're like, Jesus Christ. His mother um, just died. <laughs> another movie right. reference. We're talking another the movie. Movies. We're talking movies. All right. Let's uh, let's let's talk. Let's start with the hunt. Um, OK, see, I, again, another decision you get to make. <laughs> well, you, you, you make the decision. What do you want to start with? No, let's do the hunt. Because the, another round is like such a. Uh, such a thought provoking. I mean, they're both thought provoking, but like uh, I got a lot to say. I got a lot to say about both of them. Well, so the and hunt- last night you alluded to the fact that you're not entirely loving either of these. And this could be very content. This could end the podcast. No, 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 because no. these I- movies are masterpieces in my mind. Master. You are you are misrepresenting me. You are doing a false news headline. I, I think both these movies have I, th- I have some problems with both of these movies. Uh, more problems with the hunt than another round, I think. But like, uh, uh-huh. so I you've also- come around. Yeah, I've come around I've because come around. last night we were in a cab and you were saying I got 15 minutes in. I had to stop. It's slow. It's boring. That's what you said. Well, I fucking I was I hadn't had any sleep. I'd been in Minnesota for a week. It was negative 12 degrees. I was watching it on a plane. I was really tired. It was a bad time to watch it. But then I, I drank coffee and watched it this morning. And it's 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 a it's a masterful movie. I can't wait to talk about it. But both these movies are so uh, provocative and yes. so like uh, <laughs> antithetical to many of the uh, the norms right now in society about what you think, you know, especially the hunt. I mean, the hunt is a uh, I mean, this first of all, this movie could not be made today. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. It came out pre me Too movement. If you made this movie now, they would fucking put a bullet in your head and drag you behind a car to make an example of you. You would be canceled just pitching this movie, like not even the movie. You, you would be like, I have a movie about a guy who's falsely inclu- accused. You're like, you're never working in Hollywood again. <laughs> They'd fucking it's, put him in a wood chipper like fucking it, it, Carl Showalter. And it's insane. And, and like, I mean, the movie, I mean, it's got to be Woody Allen's favorite movie. I said this before. He must love this fucking movie because it is about a child making a false accusation. I mean, it's about bitches be lying. Um, but, <laughs> but they but do is, set it up in a way that you, you get it. It feels all yes. very plausible. Yes, it feels very plausible and it's very sympathetic to everyone, which is a key point to this movie. Uh, it's very compassionate. And so the girl is not some like evil <laughs> girl. Right. She's someone who's neglected, who, it, you know, the brother says something about a dick in front of her and you see her getting confused sexually. And then really, honestly, I mean, it's such a sad story because this is the one guy who really cares about her. Right. And he's trying to help her, the teacher, and it makes her conflicted or makes her confused. And even when she's confused, he's very nice about it. When she kisses him, he's very nice about it. He doesn't make a big deal out of it. And I guess in, in that sense, his compassion is kind of naive in this society, you know? That's another way. It's also amazing. I mean, so many thoughts come rushing in. It's also amazing that he doesn't know who it is for a while. Yes. And which is really even... interesting because you'd think he'd be like, oh, this must be about when she kissed me on the mouth. But he's which so he... innocent that he's like, I yes. don't even know what this could be. He is so innocent. He doesn't even like he just he doesn't. He do... It's like it's the kind of thing where, you know, like as an adult, you're not allowed to like, you know, play with. you got to be wary about playing with kids these days. You know what I mean? And if you do, someone's like, are you fucking that kid? And it's like the one saying, are you fucking that kid? That's the dirty minded one. You know what I mean? Right. And he's just kind of like pure, very pure, kind of like um, almost almost like a Jesus type, like just a compassionate guy who and that compassion is misconstrued. It makes him so naive in the society. He can't exist in the society without being basically persecuted like Jesus because he doesn't. He kind of doesn't see the bad in people, you know, at least right. initially, you know, it's, also, uh, <clears throat> going back to the setup and being canceled and how it's empathetic. It is. It does start with the woman being scorned. Like uh, she, uh, it's a kid. I mean, it's a kid yeah. and obviously it makes sense. But like it is a thing from the uh, from the approach of like wokeness. And this is fucked yeah. up. It does happen because she tells him she loves him and kisses him. And he's not into it. And that's when she's like, he's a rapist. <laughs> like, it is, like, there is like there is a thing that does begin that way. Obviously, it's a child. 
So she I misunderstands, guess, but she does it, feel hurt. And so she, she lashes out. She does feel hurt. She does. But you never and this is where the movie is so effective. You never feel anger towards her because she's a child. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it, uh, <laughs> you're never like that fucking cut's lying. <laughs> like you're never like, but like she uh, but you also feel really bad for her. She's neglected at home. Uh, he's the only one who's really like show it like they just ignore her and you feel and, and then she's also always saying I was <laughs> she said I make it up like 12 times during the movie and no yeah. one listening to her so the movie doesn't it's not like it does a good job of because I, I, I don't like preachy statement -y movies you know what I mean and I don't want to like you know and even though I'm like sometimes think like me too can go too far I don't want to like a movie uh that's preachy just because maybe some of the ideas I connect with, you know, you got to not like preaching this no matter what, you know what I mean? Of Whether course. it's ideas you believe in or not. But I found this movie did a great job of really not being preachy and making you, making you really feel for her and not see it as, and, and, and really understand what the town is also going through. You know what I mean? You know, what's so cool about this movie is that these people feel very ordinary and normal. They don't feel like crazy people. So when they start getting paranoid and shit, it doesn't seem, uh, honestly, it doesn't seem that it is irrational, but you can relate to it. You know what I mean? Of course. Well, I mean, it, it's hard to um, articulate so many of these stuff because there are so many layers to this movie and so many things going on. But it is a thing of this is where it's so crazy with all this stuff, because it's like if you're wrong, you're doing the next worst thing. Yes. Behind violating somebody is accusing somebody of doing something that didn't do that thing. And it gets to the it gets to the real consequence of ac accusing someone, which is the real awful thing about it. When someone is accused, they're basically alienated from everyone forever a little bit <laughs> like, well, like they're just basically no one can fully once you're accused. Everyone in your life, even if they're close to you, except maybe the very closest people are like, did you, though? <laughs> like, like, you're just completely. Well, of course, alien. even if you're right. completely exonerated. From yes. It. I mean, there are still Duke lacrosse jokes. Yes. And there's there, it, it forever goes on. You're still that thing. And that's the thing about um, accusations in general, whether it be sexual or otherwise. Is I mean, this is what we're saying, but it's like. There's a, a, a percentage of people that are always like, of course he did. And why would somebody say something if it, if something didn't happen? Exactly. And then so then and because that was such his love, he can't even ever go back to. Living the way yeah. he was, it's he's forever he fucked up. I mean, the moral is if you're an adult man, you should not teach kindergarten. You just shouldn't do it. It's just it's just it should be, it should be middle well. school kids teaching the kindergartners. <laughs> yeah, it's just, just not only women. Uh, unfortunately, in this society, you just can't have a man teach kindergarten class because people are going to have those suspicions. But yeah, it is women never sexually assault anybody ever. <laughs> it is. Uh, it is. It is. I mean, that's the part what was his girlfriend when she goes, did you do it? And he like, you know, pushes her out of the out of the house, which is a very moving part. And it's the one of the times where you act very even though this guy does seem very gentle, he acts very violent and erratic, but you also understand like no one's believing him and even her, even though she might kind of believe him. She had she been believing him. You had been believing him, but she's still kind of like, did, and the reason she's suspicious is once again, his, his gentleness that the girl comes to the house and he doesn't like most people be like, get the fuck away from me, bitch and slam the door. But in that moment, the girlfriend sees him talking to the girl and being open to her still and being like, you can, you know, it's not a good time, but he's not like, get away from me. And she, and that compassion leads the, the girlfriend to be suspicious. Right. Like it's his like it's his thinking of the good and human nature that makes him suspected of pedophilia. <laughs> you know right, I mean? right. And well, that's what's the irony of the movie, you know, and the girl is just fantastic. I mean, she's Amazing. a kid and most kid actors are not particularly great. And you have to, like, minimize their time on screen. But she's so good. And oh she has that God. weird twitch. We she talked about that twitch, that doing. twitch, that like that itch or whatever it is, is so incredible and relatable. Uh, and re <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But you're a spastic fella and uh, so uh, relatable and. And she's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, her acting really is, is so crucial to the movie, which again, um, Thomas Vinterberg, uh, this guy might be the best filmmaker there is right now. I mean, like, I don't know how he got this performance out of this kid. And it's so fucking raw and real. At one point, a teenager fucking hocks a loogie on her face, which I'm sure they faked. 
but it's yeah. still so intense. And, and I just want to get all these things out because we're going to run out of time to talk about the other movie, too. But this movie, more than any movie I've ever watched, causes a visceral reaction yes. in me. I feel like I, I'm not even I have to consciously breathe. It's just so fucking it compelling. Is, it is one of the most it is it is the most uh captivated i've ever been watching a movie in this podcast like thing just like i can't take my eyes off eyes off the screen and i guess ultimately it is the man's man's greatest horror movie you know what i mean it ain't it, the, the scariest movie for a man ain't a uh, shark or freddy krueger it's uh <laughs> it's a girl saying you uh, inappropriately touched me <laughs> and what's interesting too is they never get to or explain to any of the characters where that came from that she saw her brother because what happens of course yes. is her brother shows her porn which is abuse in itself and again like you said she's neglected these are shitty parents which we talk about this a little bit there's a little bit of flaw script wise where it's like he's best friends with these people and then they seem pretty nice after this well there's a little i mean there's a there's a lot of flaws in the sense that like they don't fu- the, the, i think the main flaw in the movie they don't fully develop um his relationship to the best friend you don't get a sense of them really being best friends in the sense that like i don't know i always took it as in the movie that everyone else seems pretty manly and he seems a little more uh gentle you know which makes him kind of a bit of an outsider but then they're best friends which i just found i, I didn't get a sense of that friendship right away I don't but know. they just, hunt they hunt together they drink they together hunt. but it is a lot of like you said it's, it's not as much showing and you also don't have enough time for the setup because you have to get yeah. to this stuff though there is quite a bit of setup it's about 35 minutes in before this happens they're and you do up, see them drinking the together, wheel, hanging out together. But the my wheels f- are turning like right away, which is, makes it tense. You know, the, the train is coming, you know. Right. But my thing with that, I said the first time I saw it, and I thought again this time is like my best friend. And he says my very, very, very best friend. And I'm yeah. like, my closest friend has two young kids who I am frequently alone with. I'm their uncle. The kid's named after me. And we wrestle and there's always things when kids are kids that like they don't know they're like burying their head in your groin because you're yeah, wrestling yeah, around course. so it's yeah, like there's know, yeah. plenty of that it's like if this happened my friend would immediately be like no what what's well, the deal yeah. with it like it's so it is a little weird but they establish the best friend guy as a fucking alcoholic who's in the mid whose life is sort of coming apart but does it doesn't though i mean I, maybe i'm just misinterpreting but doesn't he seem like the main character just seem a little different than everyone in a way where like you don't see them as like best friends i know he's hanging out with them but i don't know there's something about him that seems a little like different like not as manly or just a little more like i guess the fact that he's a kindergarten teacher is just kind of like a little uh um i don't know not your typical macho dude when everyone else in the town there's a lot of machismo in the town you know i guess but he pounds beer he seems more he sensitive pound beer. but he, he pounds beer more... as he hunts and the guy the other guy the rich guy who lives in a castle um yeah. who's the godfather to his son which by the way you think his best friend would be the godfather i'm telling you they don't develop the the french like like he's very sensitive he seems very sensitive and the i'm, I'm sorry i cut you off about the godfather guy we well talking? i was just gonna say the godfather guy also is very sweet and empathetic and he takes in his son and he talks to him. I mean, they're all very kind. I, I see the friendship there. I just think I see the friendship between them two a lot more. Like, certainly. that's my problem. Yeah, like the, the issue was him being he's very sensitive, to the main guy. And the other guy, the father of the child, seems like the manliest guy ever. He just seems like a fucking grizzly bear, which is fine. A sensitive dude can be friends with like a grizzly bear of a man. But I, I want some. Exp- I, yeah, exactly. I want some explanation of how that relationship works. I guess their friendship is a big part of the movie, but you don't really see it that much before the movie. And it, beco- it comes back in the movie as such a crucial part. So I just kind of wish, I, I think that the big flaw of the movie, I still think it's great. The big flaw of the movie that they don't develop their friendship enough, I think in the beginning. Yeah, I can see that. I, I To me, it, when he first goes over there after the accusation, the best friend sort of lets him in and he's listening and talking and then he kind of snaps, which, which shows some like alcoholism. And obviously they've established yeah. that they're fighting already which they're already shitty parents. Yes, which is part of, I think this can happen a lot when a kid is, when a a kid who's neglected is accused of this. Deep down, the parents obviously feel very guilty and to expiate that guilt, they just, you know, go on the accusation 
portrayed. You know what I mean? Because it, it, it takes away their guilt in that situation. You know. But that's what I have a hard time with is like, again, I mean, we're, we're just kind of, maybe we're talking in circles, but like my best friend would just be like, that's absolutely not true because we've been friends for 30 years. Like, I know who this person is. And obviously, Mads Mickelson character is walking the kid home every day. Yes. So it's like, no, my kid is with this. But that's like the kid's best friend. They also seem to think that kid is kind of up to no good a lot. So it just, it just doesn't Do they? seem. I feel like the parents are kind of like, what's she doing now? They're kind of like annoyed by the kid a lot. When do they say, what's she doing now? Are they not? Am I making that up? I feel like they're just kind of annoyed by the kid or just ignoring her a lot. I don't know. I mean, it you're saying seems... it, so explain which scenes you're talking about. <laughs> well, well, now I'm worried I'm making it up. I don't know. Did, did, aren't they like, isn't the father like annoyed by her in the beginning? No. I don't know. I don't remember that. I just remember I the think... mother and father fighting a lot. I think they're fighting, but I think they're slightly annoyed by her. I don't know. I to the, the the friendship thing is the pro problematic in the sense that when they at some point they say they're best friends i didn't believe it i was like really like it's a while before they say that and i'm like oh i didn't even know they were that good of friends you know what i mean i mean right. i knew they were friends i thought it was more of a sean penn tim robbins <laughs> relationship like mystic river or something i didn't i didn't realize they were best friends i guess that's well, my one flaw in the movie that i didn't feel that i didn't feel that sense well i guess one way to establish that they're friends is that he's spending this much time with his kid. I know, but even that just feels like, yeah, I know. But even that feels like uh, more of him just being a really good teacher, you know what I mean? And caring for the kids. Let, let's get into some of when it, it goes really bad and they're attacking yeah. him at the grocery store and shit. Cause this is like such compelling filming. Although this is my flaw in the movie mm -hmm. is, I mean, this is a little thing that I always like talking about. And that's the name of the podcast. We talk movies. Yes. But when he headbutts, the deli counter guy. Why does that guy the biggest bitch? That part doesn't make sense. <laughs> that to me is the only part in the movie that's poorly written because there's what? this guy who's he works on the deli counter. He's working in beef and we've established every man there is it's a very manly culture where yes. they hunt and you're outdoorsmen and you drink. And this guy's like, get the fuck out of here. And he beats the shit out of Mads Mickelson. Yeah. And then Mads comes back and headbutts him. And the guy's laying on the ground going, it hurts. It hurts. <laughs> I'm like, a, what? He's just a little bitch. I mean, who would react to that that way? It's a it's a weird moment. I mean, I guess they're, they're trying to show that this gentle guy has now become kind of like finally sticking up for himself. But it's a weird like movie hero action movie moment in a, in a movie that's otherwise kind of a pretty stark expose. It's like a real like he got his revenge in that moment. You know, and they give him his dark. groceries. They're not and like, they, yeah. no, fuck you. Get out of here. They don't it's team like up weird, on him. Jason Statham moment. I read I read an interview with uh, what's his name? Vinder uh, Thomas Vinterberg. And he said originally the character was going to be like a tough De Niro type character. And then he kind of made him a little more like uh, gentle and stuff. But I think he said that in that scene, he was trying to make him more of the the old action hero guy again. But I, I was like it, tonally that felt weird to me, you know? Well, I thought it, I thought it was good. I liked it. I liked the idea of him going back good. in there. But if then they had fought a little bit more <clears throat> or they yeah. got the best of him again, it's just that deli guy is a big, tough guy who well, obviously yeah. knows how to fight and isn't afraid to fight. A headbutt wouldn't make him lie on the ground going, no, it, it hurts, it hurts. In reality, you would headbutt him and the guy would just be standing there not and then just punch him a lot more and beat him up again. He would just right. beat him up as just what I said. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm reiterating slash not <laughs> listening. Um, but, uh, yeah, that part, I mean, it felt good, but it, it felt like a it felt like a scene in an action movie. Where like, yeah. And that, it, this does not feel like that kind of movie where you're supposed to go. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know but I mean? How about it, they fucking kill his dog? I mean, how crazy is that? I mean, and that's that thing of like, this is just gone out of control, which is the equivalent of like, to me, Twitter being like he raped 10 people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're it like, is, what? It is getting like there is this like the movie shows this like violence. Uh, it's just right below the surface and how quickly it comes out. And, and it's almost like, you know, when you watch a movie, you're almost like, wow, people are just inherently violent. And an accusation like this allows people to get that violence out, which I think is kind of like the point of the movie. Like we are kind of like, you know, we're civilized, but behind that civilization is that barbarian nature of ours. And an accusation gives us the moral certitude to like get that violence out which we're going to have to get out no matter what. But this gets lets us get it out while being self-righteous, you know?
And this is why it's so compelling. We talked about earlier, like, <laughs> like it's like he is either molesting a bunch of children, which is like, if you believe that, you're like, let's kill his dog. Let's beat the shit out of yeah. him. Let's make him unwelcome here. Fuck this guy. And if he isn't, you're like, are we ruining an innocent person's life? It's like they need it's you know what it is, too. There's, there's, there's something so unsettling about this movie in the sense that you watch it and you feel like they kind of want it to be true. And well, what is that urge? What is that urge in people that we want it to be true? Where does that come from? That's the question the movie raises. Where does that come from? That 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 urge for people to come together and be like, it has to be true. You know, well, the, well, in this case, it's like you want to believe children and protect children. Everybody wants to believe and protect children. Deep, more ingrained in us than violence is to protect children. I think protecting children, I think on another level, we are a tribal. We are tribal. And I think when you accuse someone, what you're essentially doing is kicking them out of the tribe, which is like a form of extinction. And I think that's such a terrifying thing for people to have that when you accuse someone, everyone else is a it's everyone else's biggest fear getting kicked out of the tribe. So they have to come together to make sure they're not also kicked out of the tribe. You know what right. I mean? We're like, we got to, we got to stick together because this is our biggest fear. So when someone gets accused, we all come together uh, to accuse that guy to feel like we're not going to get kicked out like they are. You know, I don't mean? know. I mean, accused to, me, to keep from being accused, you know, that I think that's a fear deep down. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, to me, it's to me, I just read it as they're trying to protect the kid. They're like, okay, that's happening. This guy, Everyone's saying it. The kids said it. We got to take care of this. We got to make sure this guy doesn't fucking assault our children anymore. I mean, that, that's definitely there, too. But like, you know, once it goes beyond that, kicking him out of the grocery store and all that, that's I think that's in a way you're going. Those are the people going. Look at me. I'm also accusing him. Let's make sure I'm still part of the tribe. You know what I mean? Right, right. Because it is our big. I mean, getting kicked. You know, we're we're, you know, come from hunter gatherers and we come from small tribes and getting kicked out of the tribe was the ultimate death. You know what I mean? You needed that tribe. So this is the biggest fear ever being kicked out of the tribe, you know, which is so crazy about accusations because you are accusations is essentially like a fear of extinction, a, 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 a fear of, you know, it's the ultimate, like, you know, attack against survival, you know, on an evolutionary level, you know? Right. And that is an interesting thing. Like you talk about that. We see a lot now with a lot of, stuff on social media and wokeism mm -hmm. and all this stuff is people do want the worst. They want, they want there the to worst. be like vile racism. They want there to be prejudice. They want there to be fucking abuse. And when if, it, if it's something is proven not, they go, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I maybe like it's like, shouldn't that be good news if somebody's exonerated? Well Exactly. And, and, and the movie doesn't answer it, but raises that question. Why do we want that? And, and I, I do think it has something to do with. We also have a lot of anger that in life from disappointments, a lot of anger that no one's really to blame for. So it's really nice to find someone to direct that anger at, you know what I mean? You can put a lot of baggage on just one person. I right. guess I do think, did you feel like, I, I would have liked to see a little more of the community and, and like them and how they react to it. Did you feel like it would have been more, cause you see it kind of from a dis, you see how they behave, but you don't see them like. No, I, well, I like it because it's his movie. It's told his through movie. his eyes. So you don't get to see that. He doesn't get to yeah. see that. He doesn't yeah. get get to see everybody getting together and going, hey, what a piece of shit. I don't know. I like it, whatever. He's just isolated in his house in this island. And he slowly finds out his son doesn't want to talk to him. He's got a dead dog on his front yard. He can't go to the grocery store. So to me, that's it. It makes it more isolating and it yes. puts you in that spot. You have that experience like he so has. Though it is interesting, it is from his perspective, and you're right. That's a great point, and that I think you're right. If it showed more of the community, it would it would deflate that tension a little. Though it is interesting, it is from all his perspective, and yet he does disappear when he goes to jail, which is an interesting section in the movie. Like it's yeah, and it, well, it kind of his son kind of takes it over, and now it's over, through him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it is what's so great about the movie. It is you're watching like a normal like middle class world, and yet it is a horror movie. <laughs> it's <laughs> it a horror movie, much. and it has that horror movie horror ending. Movie. That last yes. moment is so shocking and just I don't even know how to describe. I don't have I'm not smart enough to have a word to describe how I felt the first time and even the second time I watched it. It's jarring and, and terrifying. And it does give you this thing of like, well, this isn't over that thing. It's like It'll this is carried through. It will never be over. And that's what's so brilliant about the movie, because it shows like once you're accused, 
once you're accused, you're just kind of forever fucked. <laughs> yeah, even if you uh, apologize and admit to wrongdoing and say I, I fucked up and I shouldn't have done that, or even if you continue to be a good not, person, even if people say it's not true, you're fucked. Like you know what I mean? Because it's just you know, no matter how well you know someone, if someone else is like, they raped me, you're like, did they? No matter how well you know someone, you're just like it. Just accusations. Nothing makes someone more alone than an accusation. It just alienates you from everyone. You know what I mean? Right. And, it, and that stink never rubs off and the violence is still right there. It's a brilliant ending and calling the movie The Hunt. I mean, obviously, there's like a metaphor there, but then literally combining it at the end mm -hmm. uh, is such a it's overt, but it's great. I want to talk before we get to the next movie. I think my favorite moment, though, in the movie right before that moment, and it shows you that, like, even though this movie is a critique on, um, you know, <laughs> man's inhumanity to man. Uh, this director is so um, great at showing the good sides of humanity too. You know what I mean? He isn't just watching, you're, you're not just watching a cold misanthropic, you know, critique. You see some beautiful stuff. You see this moment between the the two friends when he looks in his eyes at the church and realizes he's, he is uh, um, innocent and them, co them coming together. You see that beautiful moment. And I think one of the most beautiful moments in the movie is at the very end when the girl is standing outside the door once he's mm -hmm. kind of been brought back to society and she's afraid to walk over the steps. And even after all the shit that's happened, when most people would be like, I'm going to never talk to that girl again, no matter what, he still picks her up and carries her over the cracks. And I think that is one of the most beautiful moments in, in, in any movie. To, for all the shit he's gone through, to him still show her love that could be misinterpreted just because he cares about her is just such a beautiful moment to me. Of course. Yeah. And he's because he's so empathetic towards her and she's a victim throughout this whole thing. She starts out as a victim a and victim. at the end, is, it continues to be a victim. She's a victim. And that's what makes the movie not like didactic or like just making a point. It's because sometimes when a movie makes a point, it can make characters unempathetic like uh, that. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, promising young woman where there's just so many like clear villains because it's just making a point the whole time, you know, right. This is such the opposite of that movie in the sense that like you, you're not angry at her and you realize that accusing someone and like even though they think they're defending her, they're making it much worse for her, too. You know what I mean? Of course. Um, yeah. And, and they don't care as much about her as they care about their own place in society and pe feeling good about themselves, you know. But that moment <clears throat> of picking her up and showing his compassion, how it doesn't keep him from still going back to that is such a a beautiful moment and to have that back to back with uh, someone shooting him in the trying to kill him in the woods is an amazing way of a movie to show humanity's evil and it's amazing capability for good now they're trying to kill him or they're sending a message i don't know i mean i guess it's kind of a little inner <laughs> interwoven when you shoot at someone you know I think if they wanted to kill him, though, he would have been dead. I think it's more of a watch your back. Yeah, I guess it's a watch your back. And who did it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're not supposed to know, right? I, I mean, I think, but I'm asking. I'm, I'm putting it to you. Like, I, don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's Agatha Christie. Like, uh, I don't know. I mean, who killed the dog, too? Which is for a second, I thought it was a friend, but I guess it wasn't, obviously. Um, no, I think it's some townspeople shit. And I don't think he knows. I mean, the, the, the point of my question is, he has to live his life not knowing yes who did this right and uh and so yeah exactly but yeah, it's I a mean, small group of people in the woods it's not everybody <laughs> yeah. the whole town's down in the woods yeah it's so like it's of, like <laughs> oh, it's one of these seven guys yeah you're not you know he's never fully safe yeah i mean it's just it's, it's a brilliant ending and it's and, and to have those moments back to back just like a moment of true like generosity of human spirit right next to like the evil of humanity is like such a great complicated nuance way to end a movie you know yeah and there's also this interesting factor of like this is how you this is still even the, everything we just went through this is how you become a man he just went through all yeah. this stuff but he's like to be a man you have to go out and kill an innocent creature or else which you're not a man which is fascinating because he is um you know, on one hand, it's interesting the hunt, the relationship between him and hunting, because he is a gentle guy, right? Mm -hmm. And you'd think in a movie like this, they'd show him like be against hunting in a way. You know what I mean? That would be the obvious. But it's choice. so ingrained in part of the culture, yeah. As and is the metaphor. And so he's literally teaching his son to hunt. 
<laughs> yes. Though, like, so it is interesting to see that he is much a part of that as anyone else, you know? Exactly. And he's not, he's not like, there are moments in this movie where you feel like he's not a saint. I mean, there are moments in the movie where, he, and that's what's cool. He's not like a saint who's being persecuted. He does erratic shit. He fights people. He gets, goes crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, he's a he little, yeah. But he's not a saint. He is, he has a gentle quality, but he is just much as part of that society as anyone else, you know? Right. All right, we got to get to great movie. Though. The other great, movie, great, great movie. movie, great filmmaking. This is the kind of movie, and, and this is for both of these movies. These are the kind of movies I just fucking love, and I wish every movie was much, much similar to this in style and in script and in performance. Yeah, it, it is. These movies are like America just can't make these movies. <laughs> no, and, and instead, yeah. and another round, it's like. This movie wins Best Picture, Best Foreign Film at the Academy Awards. And instead of Hollywood coming out and being like, we urge you to go watch these foreign films. These are these are masterpieces. Instead, Leonardo DiCaprio buys the rights to it and is like, I'm going to make that so Americans can watch it. And I can tell you, Americans are able to watch it. It's available. You can get it. It was in the theater. You can buy it. It, it exists. You don't have to wait for stupid Leonardo DiCaprio to fucking remake a movie that's already been made. It's like I, I would get it if there was no such thing as subtitles. You know what I mean? And so it's like, well, I have no idea what they're saying. I can't learn, uh, you know, Dutch. Uh, is it Dutch? Yeah, it's Dutch. Um, but uh, it's not but Dutch. Subtitle. What? It's not Dutch. It's Danish. Holland? Danish. What's yeah. Holland? That's the um, Netherlands. <laughs> the water of the Dutch. All right. So, um, so wait, it's Danish, which is Denmark. Yes. And Dutch is Netherlands. Netherlands. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, so it's uh, yeah. I mean, there's subtitles and it's great acting. Yeah, it's crazy. It's just it's American exceptionalism. We can't. We have to make it an American movie to really value it. But uh, and it just shows you that we're not. No one else in the world has this problem. They watch foreign movies. It's like everyone else is more globally connected than we are. Well, also, it's like. Just be influenced and make a move. Just uh, why not watch a movie like another round and be like, I want to watch a movie. I want to make a movie about a midlife crisis that speaks to, you know, the the emptiness of life and how to find and fill this fucking hole that we're all have and and friendship yeah. and relationships and youth and age. Let me try to make a movie like that instead of like, yeah. oh, oh, they got it. I'll make that. It, it, it's <laughs> like I said this last night. It's like if a comedian saw your special with this guy is great, but not that many people know about him. I'm going to do this act. That's a great point. You're totally right. It's stealing. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like you think I'm dumb because then when I make a point, you're like, whoa, <laughs> it hurts my feelings. That's actually, I mean, <laughs> breaking a real pattern here. That is actually no. I it is true. It is just stealing. It is fucking stealing. It, of course, it like, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, exists. You're right. The movie exists. Tell people to watch the thing that exists. Yeah, you're real. You're totally you're totally it's like this. Yeah, you're just stealing a movie. Yeah, this is a great point. Yeah. Um, but so uh, seriously, I can't, is that your point? You didn't get it from someone else. It's like it'd be like if I was like, because I think they're like, we bought the right. So it's like if it'd be like if I just was like, run on. Here's one hundred thousand dollars. I'm just going to do your act <laughs> without the list. That's your act That's that already <laughs> you that, have a list. That's the foreign language. No one can understand you. I'm going to it, do it without it. <laughs> I know. I know it already exists and I could just point people to your YouTube, but I think I will just say it because I want to feel smart and part of yeah. this. So I'll just take your thoughts. Yes. But I mean, I guess the other reality is, I mean, most people aren't going to watch this movie. So I guess. It is. So that's it. Then they don't get to see it. They don't get to see it. Yeah, no, it's a good. It's a good point. It's a good point. Um, this movie, first of all, I mean, it's I I'm so curious to know your uh, feelings on this movie because you're a, um, a sober guy. You're a, a friend of what about Bill W. I'm allowed to say that, right? Or no? Am I not? Allowed well, I mean, you can't. It doesn't make sense because you're not part of it. So it's weird. Oh, I'm sorry. I've done I've done a couple of meetings. <laughs> All right, fine. Sorry, I can't talk about Bill. But anyway, the point is, I mean, you know, you could say just it's not I'm not offended. It's just weird. It's like being like uh, I've met him. Yeah, it's like <laughs> we're acquaintances. It's like being like you could say Semper Fi to a Marine. But then the Marines <laughs> like, oh, you're a Marine. And you're like, no, he's like, what? Oh, like, that's right, our fucking it's, thing. It's a code. All right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So yeah. anyway, we're both. Don't Semper drink. Fi, brother. 
We're both. <laughs> That's a good point. We're you both... say thanks for your service or whatever. You know what I mean? All you right, say well, a thank different you for thing. your service for not drinking. Um, but we're no, both... I meant to a Marine, you dummy. I know. I know. We're both not drinking. Um, but this movie is I mean, I got to say it's <laughs> it's a brilliant movie. It is in the same way that Sideways is this great, sad midlife take on like swingers. You know, it's basically like middle age crisis swingers. This is essentially that, but for like the fucking old school. You know what I mean? It's like the sad midlife version of a dumb American comedy, you know? And it has many of the tropes of those American comedies. Like, you know, even a gimmick kind of similar to old school. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, but, it, but it's a very <laughs> sad middle-aged version of that. But I got to say, I mean, how do you feel? Like this movie is definitely triggering. <laughs> it's true. Well, first of all, I want to say this is one of my favorite movies of all time. I think it's one okay. of the best movies in the last 20 years. Maybe the best movie since No Country for me. I haven't loved yeah. a movie this much since No Country for Old Men in 06 or 07, I think it was. And I assume everyone's seen the movie for watching this. If you haven't, just to show you how interesting that statement is, Joe is uh, sober and this is a movie that is not anti-alcohol <laughs> well it is well what's crazy about the movie is it is triggering to me it is because yeah. when they start drinking it is so fun and it makes me miss <laughs> drinking i it's, mean first of all this movie is hilarious like i yes. die the moment when the guy from the hunt the the soccer coach guy does this in the face <laughs> of the grocery store it is one of the funniest moments in any movie well, when he, they, has, he just he just fucking kind of like it's so real. It's the, the performances are so great. The script is amazing. But when they start drinking, it makes me want to do that. It makes me want to drink. Yes. But of course, it comes apart. And it's like, exactly. And that's the thing we say in alcoholics. Alcoholics say is that you say like you don't think of the first drink. You think of the last drunk. Yes, yes. It's yes. like, yes, that first drink seems so fun, but you know where it leads and it doesn't lead to a fun place. Well, the movie gets into something very philosophical about it's not just watching people have fun. It's bringing up also a, a truth about drugs and alcohol. It does make you more passionate about life. Of course, and, and for a little bit, for a little bit. And sobriety can make you feel dead inside after a while, or that's just the way life is. I don't feel, I don't feel that way because I work but, a program that you don't <laughs> <laughs> I feel the exact opposite. Well, I just say, but, but there is this, this, this relation because the movie does not moralize, which is incredible. It doesn't, it, it sees alcohol the way it sees life. It has its ups and downs, <laughs> right? You know, it has its joys and sorrows. And the, the most brilliant thing about the movie, it doesn't, it ends with him drinking and partying, you know what I mean? And it's like, it has this view of alcohol just similar to life. Yeah, there's joys and sorrows and it's an exaggerated version of the, you know, vicis vicissitudes of life, of the different, like, you know, ups and downs, you know what I mean? Um, but like, uh, it is this incredible, like a movie, American movie couldn't make this. And I, I think one of the things that I love about this movie, and it's the thing I hate about so many movies about drugs and alcohol, is that they never show you the good parts. So you, right. they're, they're, they're just moralizing. It's why I always hated Requiem for a Dream. You're just showing people's lives be miserable. But then I'm like, well, then why are they doing it? If their right. lives are becoming miserable, why are they doing it? And the answer is, it feels so good at first. And show that. Show that in a movie. And they never show it. In every movie with drugs, it's always like people just like sucking dick for heroin right away. Or it's leaving Las Vegas. He's just become Beetlejuice. They never show like the actual life affirming qualities of alcohol or drugs, which this movie does right away. Like, and that's what makes it so triggering. It's not that they're partying that makes it triggering. It's that he's been a boring ass teacher and he drinks and has his first inspiring class. <laughs> yeah, and it's going well, and it's going well for all of and them. And it's going well for all of them, and it's, and that what makes it so triggering. You're like, oh my, it, it, which is, and it makes me think about another thing in life, which is that people think triggering is such a bad thing, like this movie triggered me, and you're like, no, no, triggering means, a lot of times that it means it's, if, it, if you're saying a movie, an art is triggering, it means it's effective. It's, it's making effective. you feel something. That's like, the opposite of triggered is being dead to emotions. You know what I mean? Like, you're like, oh, this movie made me feel emotions. <laughs> like, uh, but this is like, this really is unsettling watching because I'm like, fuck, like, 
I mean, like, I'm like, you're watching that first part and you're going through the experience of alcoholism all over again, where like how great it is that first and how it's connected to your youth, you know? Right. I and mean, that's and that's how drinking felt for me. I never drank through high school and I was fun. I was a fun, funny guy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm making the right decision. I don't want to be one of these drunks because everyone I knew that drank was miserable. They had miserable yes. lives and then they drank on the weekends and then that became fun. And the only time life was meaningful or worth living was when you're drinking and drunk. And so yes. I didn't do that. And then I graduated high school and I felt I started doing comedy, but I did it once a week. I didn't really belong anywhere. And I felt this depression of like, I'm not in high school. I don't have an audience anymore. I don't belong anywhere. I used to be so cool just a year ago. Yes. And now I'm just trying to do comedy, but I suck and I'm new. And then I had my first drink and was like, oh, man, I was way off about alcohol. This yes. gives me meaning. Life has yes. meaning now because I'm drinking. And then you go tonight. Let's get drunk again. That was fun. It wasn't fun when we were sober. It was fun. When we were drinking. Let's drink every day. And it, just like in the movie, then you're pissing in the bed and your wife hates you, which is such an amazing scene when they decide to get fully blacked out and they're falling over in the grocery store, which even that seems a little fun until the next day. Mads is fucking bleeding on the front doorstep and the guy's That's wife it. is going to leave him. That's such a great moment of him just on the ground. You know what I mean? Just collapsed. This is, and the, and his the son ground. comes over and goes, this isn't our house. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's such an interesting, but but it is because essentially this group of adults essentially kind of go through the stages of drink from youth again to adult. You know what I mean? They go through it again. All the stages, you know, they, they, they recapture the excitement of youth and then all the dangers of alcohol and the consequences. But what is so interesting, I guess maybe you feel this way, like the joy you got from alcohol, you can't turn away from, you can't turn that away. That's still a part of your life. You know what I mean? Yes. And well, you can't ignore it. And what's another interesting uh, underlying thing about this movie, there's all these movies or both these movies are, have so much depth. Yeah. And this is another thing about this movie is that it's about you can't get your youth back. I mean, the alcohol represents youth. Yes. And yes. and that's why they have the race at the beginning. It starts with kids yes. drinking and all Which this you stuff. Think- you think of maybe them from childhood at first, at least I did. I thought, oh, this must be the kids. And then they grow up and I realized, you know, oh, it's just the kids from right now, which I thought was interesting. I didn't think that at all, but <laughs> but it, it, it represents youth and they're trying to get their youth yes. back is what they're trying to do. And it just doesn't work. And in fact, what happens is it makes it that much more clear because of the repercussions that they are middle aged. Yes. And that yes. there's no there's no turning back the clock. You can't control any of this stuff, which is what drinking is really about, is trying to control your life. But in it's, reality, you're out of control. It's not exactly regretful at the end. You know what I mean? Like he it, to me, the movie. Yes, it does show the, the pratfalls of drinking. But at the same time, I feel like it also shows a lot of the joyous parts of drinking and how drinking like life is, you know, it can. I don't know. I guess it felt important for the journey for him this whole time. You know what I mean? His life is better at the end. <laughs> well, it's not regretful and it's not regretful to try to regain some of your youth. It's just yes. not going to work out. Right. As well as you want it to. It's not going to work out. As, yeah, point. But there are going to be good moments like that. I mean, at the end, he is drinking and. Yes. Which, at the end, you know, which, which is which, interesting, too, which is up for. um Analysis, because it feels like his wife wants him back and things start yes. to work out again. But what's going to happen later that night when he's soaking wet and hammered again? Because she was yeah, mad he, that he was drinking so much and now he's going to be hung over and drunk. So it's it feels like he's making a mistake by drinking the way he is at the end. Well, that's interesting. That was your see, this is interesting. Like it, and it's what's great about the movie. It's very different perspective. So you kind of see it as a somewhat. That's why I said open to analysis. Yeah, you see it as a somewhat bleak ending, I guess, or somewhat like he's fucking up this last opportunity, right? I don't know if it's his last, but like certainly the drinking caused this huge fight with them and it got weird, which the the best scene, by the way, I just want to digress for a moment. The best scene in the whole movie is the fight between the two of them at the breakfast table. I think it's at night. And she says she has been having an affair when he fucking swipes the table. (laughs) It is one of the most shocking moments in any movie. Both both times I've seen it. It really gave me like a jolt because you don't see it coming. And he's not that guy. Yeah. And it's similar to the hunt. Like all of a sudden there's this rage in him and right in front of his kids. That is such a fucking scary, fascinating uh, like it visceral is so scene. abrupt, and then of course another like he yells, "Get out!" and then immediately leaves. <laughs> and he leaves exactly. <laughs> so so great that to me is the best sequence in the movie. 
Um, and the best, it's the best directing in the movie. It's the best performance in the movie. But anyways, so all this stuff comes from this drinking experiment. And then weeks later, he gets what he wants. She's like, I want you back and I miss you. And he, and I've had this feeling when you get something you want, you're excited. You just go great. And you don't go towards it. You go back to fucking drinking and it never worked out for me. So maybe it'll work out. That's how I saw it. It is interesting because it's, yes, you're right. It's it's open to analysis because it is, you can look at it like that, but it's definitely filmed. The ending is filmed in a very joyous way, like capturing, like, if you just showed that scene on its own, it's just like a very exciting, like fun, almost like an 80s movie fun ending. You know what I mean? Right. It's just him doing jazz moves, dancing, like, and in a way, you know, I don't know. I guess I saw it as kind of like, I don't know. It's It's a weird thing. I guess I saw it as like, not even a love letter to alcohol, but a love letter to life that even yes, life was bad. You kind of just jump and fail and you jump into that water and you make mistakes, but it's still this kind of uh, explosion of feeling and it's just not negating any of it. You know, I guess I see it as like just kind of like um, a love letter to life in that moment, you know? Absolutely. And life is open to analysis. And I do yeah, think right. alcohol is a metaphor for life in the movie. Yes, very much like sideways. Just like sideways in a different way. Um, alcohol just, just is, like it in a different way. <laughs> well, I mean, alcohol. Well, in sideways, the wine becomes a different, you know, the way they talk about the wine is essentially how they're talking about their lives and so much. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and, and similar to this, alcohol is is like life. It's it's full of passion and joy, and mistakes and regrets. But you're alive. You know what I mean? And it's a uh, it's a fascinating thing. I mean, it, it's it's such a fascinating movie. Because it is like this, the gimmick of it is just is like an old school gimmick. What if we got drunk every day and wrote an essay? You know what I mean? But like, at the, it, it feels like a gimmick of a like a dumb, like, uh, you know, uh, American comedy. And interestingly, those American comedies, even though I love them, they are about midlife crises. Like old school is about a midlife crisis, you know? Right. But they're doing this with there's so much emotional baggage underneath in this movie that is like, you know, uh, interesting. It's just interesting tonally, you know. It's like poignant old school, yeah, with, with also sadness and philosophy and stuff because it yes. is about again that sort of god sized whole meaninglessness of yes. life. Um, but it's also hilarious, and, and because of those reasons, because it's so real and so meaningful, it's like the, the laughs are bigger than old school could ever yes. want. I mean, it is and, hilarious. Uh, I mean, that the scenes where he's like, I'm in when they're like, What if we saw what if we got the drunk as possible we can? I'm down. Also, like, there's so many great moments when Mads walks into the fucking wall is so, uh, like, well, stunning. Uh, the uh, my the part I laughed the most at uh, was the other guy. The uh, who's his friend and uh, yeah, the hunt. Uh, you know, the part was the hand thing, which is great. But the other part that's just so funny is when I, mean, I think it's the funniest part of the movie is when the principal is saying there's been a lot of drinking uh, from adults on this campus. And we don't know who yet. And you just hear from the stairwell, I'm running late. <laughs> I mean, just, the way he, he flops stumbles. on the couch, <laughs> he just stumbles. <laughs> it's such a hilarious moment. Oh, it's amazing. It's amazingly funny. And then it's also just tragic. I mean, we're also leaving out the back where the guy fucking goes and kills himself. I mean, what a fuck. It's so, so tragic, but also like, oh, do you think he kills himself? I just, I just assume he fell off. Oh, I thought he went to kill himself. Oh, maybe yeah, he I fell off. He, I just assumed he fell off, but maybe he did kill himself. Because he Damn. says parting words. He says last words to him. He's like, we're all rooting for you. I want yeah. you to get back together, whatever. Doesn't it feel like he's signing off there? Maybe he just fell off. I guess I just thought swim. he fell off. Yeah, because he can't swim. But I don't know. I mean, it's that blur, you know, between suicide and, you know, alcoholism where you don't really care if you live or not, you know? Um, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I misunderstood that. I but I thought know. he was like, he was like, here, he's like, this is what we all want for you. And uh, I care about you, which is also just so sad and beautiful because he obviously he's the one guy that is just an alcoholic. Yes, that's the problem. Like alcohol can make life, you know, it, it, it's such a big part of life, but some people just can't handle it but they still then they just die and but then they're drinking at his funeral which is such a great just to show this movie confronts a reality which is that alcohol is such a big part of life and it's such a big part of like how people function in life and like this movie goes well why is that and why do we need it and what's going behind you know let's not moralize but let's actually look at what's behind that and it is the fact that life can be deadening and monotonous 
and and there is a joy in your childhood that you lose an excitement for life in your childhood that you lose and alcohol while it has many dangerous consequences can kind of bring you back momentarily to that at times you know and the two moments too where he's there's two moments in the movie where mads the main character who's just fantastic yeah amazing yeah he's trying not to drink and ends up drinking and it's depicted so well in movie even better than in flight or whatever other depiction yeah. is that when he's at the dinner table and he's just like oh, i'm not drinking and i gotta get up and eventually after like a while he decides to have a drink and then later he's like i'm out on the experiment and they're like well we're gonna get as drunk as humanly possible and he's putting on his coat and everything <laughs> just and drink. that moment of just like ah, oh, fuck it and then it just cuts to him running up the street i mean it's just <laughs> the best depiction i've ever seen of someone trying not to drink and yes. then just being like, you know what? Oh, whatever. It's almost like he's kind of like, all right, I'll just try one for the road. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I get out of here. And, <laughs> but we all know that's not what's going to happen. Um, no, it is so. Um, uh, yeah, no, it's it's a fascinating because even flight like you. Ne I don't think you've ever shown people having fun on alcohol. No, I mean, maybe you, sh you show people have fun on alcohol in movies, but you've never shown that like it's more than fun in this movie. It's like mm -hmm. he's like. It's life affirming. It's, it's life affirming. It's also it makes them better teachers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I mean, obviously, there is some like at first I had an issue with it tonally, but then I kind of understood it. I think it is. I mean, it's filmed so realistically, but there is some far fetched almost. I don't know. It's almost like magical realism in the sense that they can get that drunk without consequences for so long. You know what I mean? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, like, I don't know. Like, I drank similarly all the time, like at every function thing. And people just didn't know. People would say that to me all the time. It just means you're a good liar. But people would say yeah. to me all the time. It's like, I didn't even realize you were drunk. I didn't know you were drunk because it's like you just can just you get mad at it. And then you just go, yeah, just really fully concentrate on being like, hey, yeah, I don't know. How, how are you doing? Well, I guess there's something a little like. Uh, it's a good joke, like the idea that they become such good teachers right away is kind of like. I don't know. It's it's a bit of a joke, I guess. I mean, I think it works, but it's a bit of like, uh, I don't know in reality if that would happen exactly that way. And I also think like there'd be consequences a lot quicker. Like their family doesn't seem to care for very long. them being super drunk, you know, it takes a while for them to get upset. But then I realized but early on, they're not getting super drunk. Either. Yeah, that's true. They're just getting like kind of. Yeah. A couple of drinks an hour. Um, but then I also realized, like, apparently I, I read somewhat like Denmark. Uh, uh, Denmark has like a like serious drinking like everyone drinks like crazy there. Well, so I think that they set that up. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So it makes me see. I, I can see why the wives take a while to be like, all right, like once you're pissing in bed, now you've <laughs> gone a little too far. But uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, it, it, it is so like it is so non moralizing and like to, and, and to show them drink after his funeral and to jazz and having a party there. And uh, do you know the backstory behind the movie? Uh, what happened? Uh, no, with his life, it's actually really crazy. So they're filming this movie, and his daughter, who's going to be in the movie, who's he, uh, Vinterberg uh, or Mickelson? Vinterberg, Vinterberg. His daughter uh, was killed in a car crash. Oh Jesus! In the middle of filming the movie, and she was killed. The guy was texting, which is not drinking and driving, but its own phone. You know, its, it's own worse. Addiction. I actually think it's yeah. worse. Well, it's worse, and it's it's like drinking. It's an addiction, and they. Uh, a legal addiction and uh she got killed during the middle of the movie i'm not even sure i'm i don't know it sounded like from what i read that they may have chosen for him to die at the end after that happened to oh, add interesting. Some more gravity to the movie but so for the director like him being life affirming at the end at the funeral is for him a very personal thing where his daughter died but he was still not ignoring the joys of life but but he says something interesting in an interview he said this movie is about losing control and the joy of losing control and the nightmare of losing control. And there's no lock. There's no more loss of control than losing your daughter. You know what I mean? Hmm. So like it, it, it is this, this movie is um, a very like, you know, it's, it's about losing control and it's, and it, but it's about kind of like, you know, the horror and joy of life, <laughs> you know? Right. And that's such a fascinating to be life affirming at the end after a death which is what the director was doing in his own life and in the movie to be life affirming after death. It takes a lot of nuance. And you, I don't know if you see that in American movies, you know? Well, there's certainly no American movies as good as this one that I've seen in the past. 
there's no decades. American movies. I mean, the way alcohol, I mean, we've talked about this on the pod a lot. The way alcoholism is depicted in American movies is always either to show someone in a dramatic moment where he just, he's never drunk, but now he's going to buy a whole flask of whiskey to show that he's in a turmoil. You know what I mean? It's never shown on a philosoph- philosophical level like this, where like alcohol is all, can be awful and can also make life really fun. I, I've just never seen the fun part, honestly, in movies, you know? It's also never... Um... Well, I feel like old school, they do show them having it's fun. It's different, though. They show them having fun, but it's a stupid fun. It's not of a course. like, it's yeah, not yeah. a like, drugs for me made, gave me a passion for life that I didn't have without drugs, you know? And this movie shows how alcohol gives, not ju- it's not just Will Ferrell being hung around, upside down, drinking out of a fucking funnel, acting like an idiot. It's showing them like, getting excited about teaching again <laughs> like right, that's, right. that's the ultimate trigger which is drugs and alcohol while having awful consequences can give you a passion in life that it's very easy to lose yes as you get also, older. also i don't know wh- how they made the movie like uh, as far as um um what do you call it uh, approaches or styles but like this is the best depiction of drunk i've ever seen like it feels like they are shit housed running up the street Yes, and I I wanted to bring this up with you because you are you know we've talked about how drunkenness is always so badly perceived in a lot of movies. We talked about yes. network. And, network. Uh, the opening scene of network is just insane. embarrassingly bad. So, the initial actually inspiration for this movie is uh, Vinderberg and uh, showed Nicholson a, uh, a YouTube video of these two. Uh, I think it was uh, r- these two guys getting re- were super drunk and trying to put a lock on a bike. You know. Mm-hmm. And they were super drunk, but they were so engaged in this mission of putting a lock on a bike. And I think that became a big inspiration to the movie that even when you're super drunk, you still have a mission, you know? So right. at their drunkest, they're literally trying to catch a uh, fresh cod. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but I, 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 li- I read a little about Mickelson and like how they were able to do it, the acting of it. I think they, I think that was a big, I think they actually, apparently they did get drunk, not on set, but like, they went to drinking boot camp to prepare for the role mm-hmm. to kind of experience it. And Mickelson said something very interesting. He said the hardest part is when you get super drunk, obviously, which they handle very well. Um, but he said it was the part where you get kind of tipsy and you're hiding it in that part. And this is a big, I think part in acting in general where you want to play the opposite. He said he didn't play it drunk. Cause when you're tipsy and hiding it, you actually overly enunciate words to show yes. that you're lucid. So he goes out of his way to be more lucid in those moments, you know what right. I mean? Which right. is an important part of acting to just act a lot of times the opposite of what you're trying to convey, you know? Well, that's what I was saying earlier is like yeah. all the time people are like, I didn't even realize you were drunk. So I'm like, yes. I'm good at faking it. You become very yeah, good at faking it. You, I mean, this is exactly what I said earlier. Well, yeah, but, it's not like I'm ignoring you, by like, <laughs> um, but it's like, yeah, you just concentrate more. I felt that way with drinking and driving, too. I'm like, I'm a better driver when I'm drinking because I'm like, all right, let me go 10 and two. I don't want to fuck up. Exactly. Here. Yeah. I, I actually felt the same way drinking. Like when I I guess maybe we weren't like because everyone shows like person drug, drug driving. They're just driving like an insane person. A lot of people do that. But I was always so cautious when I was drunk. And when I was high, I was the best driver in the world because I was like paranoid. I was going to get hit so i was like a great defensive driver um even though one time a a cop pulled me over and i was really high and i literally stopped in the middle of the road i didn't like pull over the side of the road i stopped in the middle of the road (laughs) were there repercussions yeah they uh well they had their probable cause right then (laughs) and then they they're like what are you doing stopping in the middle of the road they drove me to the uh, side of the street they're like uh can we check your car um I was high. I wasn't drunk, so they couldn't do a breathalyzer. They're like, "We're gonna check your car for uh, paraphernalia." And I'm like, "Sure." So they searched my car. This is how awful cops are. They came back and they just handcuffed me, without telling me why. This is why cops are fucking can be can be fascist. So they handcuffed me, and I had to be like, "Why are you doing this?" And they're like, "We found drugs in your car." Apparently, I I had stolen a bunch of pills from my friend's dad, and I stashed in the car, and I forgot I had done that. Um, but they handcuffed me, but I got out of it somehow. So your contention is that cops are bad <laughs> because they pulled over an inebriated person who had just stolen a bunch of drugs no. and they arrested him. They had a right to arrest me, but I did not like that. They said, 
put your hands behind your back and handcuff me without telling me why. Because that led me to be like, why are you handcuffing me? You know what I mean? I feel you like there's n- you're going to have nobody that's empathetic. Like black <laughs> people are going to be like, fuck you. <laughs> and cops and conservatives are like, yeah, fuck you. <laughs> like who like who is your target audience? And like and this in this uh, complaint. Other white privileged people. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Who mean? think that it shouldn't be, there should be no repercussions for just driving fucking high <laughs> with drugs on you that you've stolen. Um, I wish the cops fucking put your head through the windshield. <laughs> well, I told about the comedian, which I, is always a good idea. Because, you know, people like it. And then I ended up like doing some bitch while handcuffed. And uh, and then they ended up uh, unhandcuffing me and letting me go. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm I'm okay with everything that happened in this story. hundred percent of this, I'm like, classic that white, It's a classic white privilege thing I just did. I complained about the police, and I got out of it really easily. Yeah, <laughs> and you were in the wrong. You were like putting everyone in danger, including yourself. So anyway, um, so uh, what were we talking? Oh yeah, so wait, what were we talking about? Weed, alcohol, another round. I don't know. We got to wrap up. I got I got three more podcasts to do. But I was just. What was the point of the the cops and drinking? What was the fucking point was I trying to say? What was before this? I don't know. I can't follow anymore. I'm drunk right. You were probably saying something that I had said twenty minutes earlier, <laughs> but just with oh, right. way more words. <laughs> oh wait, that's oh oh the uh, enunciating or the feeling very lucid. Um, no, that wasn't it. But anyway, I. Uh, Oh, they uh, show it in movies. They show people like swerving all over the place and like, whoa, oh, drunk whatever. driving. Yeah, I was I was a very cautious driver. That was it. We got it. Um, but yeah, this movie is like, both these movies are just so nuanced and give you contradictory feelings and like uh, are complicated. And uh, yeah, you know, and uh, this movie is a love letter to the messiness of life. And uh, and uh, yeah, I loved it. And when he dies, I mean, what a shot! I, I to me, that's like I mean, I hate to, it's that's the magic of filmmaking, to show a, just a footage of him on the boat with the dog, and then cutting back and he's Godfather two, not, Godfather two. It really is a Godfather two moment. But it is such a that is the magic of filmmaking when you can show two different shots and convey the image in the audience's head without showing it. It's such a, it really is the power and haunting nature of movies that it can do that. The dialectic materialism of that to show both of those things. Um, yeah. It's just what a, what an amazing shot, you know, it's a tremendous film. The music is great. The acting is great. just incredible. The script is great and everything about it. It is everything I want in a movie and it's as good as a movie can get to me. Yeah, and it's it is this weird thing where it is. I mean, there is this like old school quality, but then with the chorus and everyone singing, there's just such beautiful like the part where he gets the kid to like win the soccer game, you know? Specs. I mean, specs and him at the end is so heartbreaking. But uh, when you see it's, him at the funeral, it's beautiful. But like the part where he gets him to win the game and like his drunkenness, this movie literally shows someone die from alcohol, and it also shows someone who if because he drank, he inspired a kid. <laughs> right. Like it shows both those things. Like the but, same but, way. But the here's hunt- the other yeah. here's the other layer in tragedy is that was in him. Yes. He didn't yes. need to drink to get that That's out. True. That is who he is. He's a sweet, thoughtful, compassionate man. And the reason he's dead is because he can't stop drinking. And if he hadn't drunk, he could have just found those things by perhaps working some kind of program that's worked for a lot of people for about 90 years. But they, that is in him and he's dead because he's drunk. He's not compassionate and sweet because he's drunk. Yeah, he's compassionate and sweet and it helps bring it out. He's dead and lonely and depressed because he's drunk. It's a good point. Yes. Al- like like we said before, alcohol is life. It's you know, it's, bo- you know, it's an exaggeration of life. It has uh, it brings out your compassion and it brings out your despair and it brings out your joy and it brings out your suicidal nature. <laughs> It does all those things. It is a depressant after all. But it does. I mean, you know, I'm not going to lie. This movie does capture the joy of alcohol. And very of course, we do that. And it's it's what a wonderful movie to 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 have the balls to show the joy of alcohol and to show it needs both. It shows the joy of alcohol and it shows someone literally dying. off. And of boat. it shows both better than any other movie. Yes. It shows the negative better than leaving Las Vegas or whatever yes. other fucking horse shit. It they shows just both never get it right. right. Like leaving Las Vegas, he's just like the Joker. <laughs> yeah. And like and like other movies are just like it just never really gets it right. And it's in this movie, yeah, it 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 
like sideways very much like sideways it captures the joy and the sorrow of life beautifully and uh yeah these movies are wonderful i'm so glad you recommended them to me yeah it was my idea um <laughs> All right, we gotta we gotta go. Uh, this is uh, I got fucking literally three more podcasts right. to do, but we're gonna we saw I saw Licorice Pizza. We're gonna do Licorice Pizza on a bonus. Join our Patreon. Yeah. We have full episodes on Patreon. Yeah, it's crazy. It's it's great. Uh, it's better than the 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 pod. Yeah. Oh, probably <laughs> maybe I don't know. Join the Patreon, and I got dates. I keep forgetting to plug. Uh, this Sunday I'm in Seattle, but it's sold out. You can't come. How exciting is that? You. Um, tickets, and Vancouver is canceled. I, they haven't emailed anybody. I gotta talk to my manager. Figure that out. Um, but then the weekend after that, I'm in Dallas. I think it's the 24th and 25th. And, um, I got some dates in February. I got Key West coming up in February, Key West, comedy Key West and, uh, laugh Boston, April 14, 15, 16. So get tickets to that and, uh, subscribe to the channel and tell friends about this show for God's sakes. Tell everybody, please tell everybody. And, um, yeah, I, I just want to, by the way, I just want to thank everyone who's, who's watched my special, my 2019 special. I uh, uploaded it on YouTube. It took me two years and uh, the, the comments have been so nice. And if you haven't watched it, go on YouTube, subscribe to my channel. I'll have a new special later this year. So thank you so much for everyone who's watched it. And if you want to see me, you can see me um, at last Seattle. Unlike Joe, it is not uh, sold out. So... <laughs> If you want to get tickets, I'm going to be there January 21st to the 22nd in Seattle. And uh, you can see me on Comedy on State, uh, top five best clubs in the country, February 4th. Number one. And, uh, um, and yeah, and uh, you may see me on something else later this week if I don't have COVID. Um, <laughs> you don't have COVID. You're going to be on. It's going to be great. All right. Well, this was a great episode. This is such a I was so excited to watch these movies. Yeah, great movies, great episode. Thanks for listening. The best thing you can do is tell some friends about the show. Subscribe, tell friends, friends, leave a good review, all that stuff. Comment. Thank yeah. you for listening. I can't believe anyone's still listening. All right, cut. All right, that's it. Cut, farts, tits, jizz.